thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> First, apologies because I can order food in Italian and I can't even talk in Italian. I hope to improve on that. So I will give my talk in English. Uh, please just tell me if anything is not clear or I get to be too fast. Okay. Second apology is that yesterday we had such a huge uh, projector that I decided to sort of cram more images uh, on my slides and now we have a smaller projector uh, so I hope most of it is legible. I will give uh, three short stories as, as I want to call them uh, because, because it's really such a huge topic that talking in abstracto, in an abstract sense, would, would be probably even less exciting than looking at specific uh, case studies. And these case studies, uh, although I start from the ancient times, will be concentrated from the 17th to the 19th century, but all of them will have relevance up to today. Okay? Uh, first, a bit about vision and optics. Uh, in ancient times, uh, we could say that what we think of optics as a kind of physical science was much more a theory of vision and not just a theory of light. So, uh, in ancient texts we have a mixture of views, lots of philosophers investigated the problem, <coughs> hardly anyone did not investigate the problem, how perception takes place, and optics fundamentally investigated not just some geometrical relationships, for example, Janus's head is much larger than any of your heads, simply because he's closer to me. Okay, this is a simple relation between size and distance and the angle of regard. That's how Euclid and some mathematicians try to mathematize parts of optics. But it was also a study of how uh, perceptual qualities uh, enter our consciousness. Pre-Socratics debated whether small animals with smaller eyes can see better small things or big things. You know, so often the eye was itself considered as something that is actively taking part in vision. Uh, if we look at this early period, we see that optics basically had three parts. Optics proper, which is linear propagation of light or sight, Many of these theories considered sight as active, like Plato's theory in the Timaios, that something is emanating uh, from the eye. Uh, that's why I sometimes can't find my key. You know, I'm looking at the table uh, and certain objects that just don't enter my consciousness, even though they are on the table. Uh, but apart from optics, we also had the optics which was the study of reflections, how to work with mirrors. These mirrors were sometimes uh, built into temples, so you could have projections of goddesses appearing in areas where you didn't see anything, uh, or also to produce burning uh, lenses. Here on the image you see how the sun's rays get, uh, in a way, used by burning uh, mirrors to set ships on fire and we also had dioptrics which was how light is changed when it enters new media. At the bottom of the page you see a guy whose legs are somewhat crooked you know, going to the side. Uh, one of the ancient tropes uh, in philosophy uh, was about the reliability of the senses how is it that if I put my hand in water, it appears to be broken, or the orb appears to be broken on the ship? So a lot of these tropes concerning vision were heavily utilized in, in old Asian philosophy 
to problematize aspects of knowledge, understanding, perception, and other issues as well. Uh, illusions were very often key aspects of this work. So, uh, both in some atomist, later atomist writers, uh, and then in people like Lucretius, illusions play a very key role, just as much as in some uh, mathematicians or geometers like Ptolemy, who in optics also has a whole book on illusions. Uh, I don't want to tell much more about the ancient sources because most of these sources got uh, rediscovered uh, during late Middle Ages and early Renaissance and some of it traveled to uh, the Arab world where we had people like Al-Kindi and Al-Hazm who systematized a number of these different philosophical strands to produce what became later the basics of medieval optics. Uh, this is what could be called the perspectivist tradition. Okay? Uh, people like Roger Bacon or Robert Brostest or the Polish Italo were all medieval writers who basically used Arab sources uh, to bring an up-to-date state of the art in optics to Europe. Is it clear? Can I? Can you understand everything? Okay. Um, basic idea uh, behind this whole tradition was that light sources an an animate uh, light in every direction. So there's a kind of spherical uh, transition or projection of light, and this spherical mapping was used together partly in geometry, and then also partly in connection with a number of other uh, One thing that will be important for the second short story is that uh, light from ancient times has often been understood as something that's connected to touching. Already we have Egyptian drawings where the sun has kinds of hands and touching objects, but, but it's quite common that the way people describe the sun or the sun's light is to describe some kind of pressure or some kind of emanation that they can sense. So there's no very, very strict separation between the modalities. Some of the modalities are used to explain uh, one another. The hero of the first, uh, here to the left, you see an image of Descartes, okay, where he, Descartes is basically trying to solve a riddle. How is it that we see distance when our eyes in themselves do not see distance. Okay, in one, with one eye we see different sizes, but we are not really clear about the distance. So the two eyes can be used to triangulate distances of objects, uh, and, and he has a metaphor or a drawing of a blind man with two sticks trying to measure how far objects are. The first hero of the story uh, is Newton. So I'm going to talk now more about Newton uh, because his way of looking at optics and vision became one of the first paradigms in modern science and is also one of the sources uh, of, of what we might call an atomistic worldview or a worldview where we only have corpus cubes. He learned a lot from Descartes but he managed to uh, make Descartes ridiculous as a scientist. So Descartes is only considered as a philosopher uh, currently, or mostly. Uh, and he also started investigating in his youth the connection between touch, mechanical uh, triggering, and vision. So here I have a small quote from one of Newton's early notebooks. While he was still a university student, like you are. He took a botkin the image on the left below, which is a small stick like a pen. And he, he tried to push it in as deep as he could to touch the actual optical nerve that, uh, that we all have. Uh, and then he investigated the following. By putting a brass plate between my eye and the bone nearer to the midst of the tunica retina than I could put my finger, 
I made a very vivid impression. If I was in the dark and the pressure on the eye was very strong towards the outside, appeared a broad circle of purple. Next blue, green, yellow, red like flame, yellow, green, blue and purple. All the other outmost colors without a strong pressure were but blue. So what we see uh, is that touch is somewhat connected to vision and the way Newton starts to do his research is partly by doing rather aggressive physiological experiments on himself to try to get a mechanical grasp how is pressure related to color. Okay? He also uh, stared into the sun, uh, sometimes stared so much into the sun that he had to shut himself up for two days uh, because he couldn't see. And there also he was seeing what's the strongest color that remains where the sun was seen and what are the other colors that are kind of next to the, these strongest colors. That's how a kind of mechanical theory of vision arose in the 17th century. A bit before Newton, actually a few hundred years before Newton, however, the perspectivist tradition strongly got connected to the so-called camera obscura descriptions. I, you know what the camera obscura is? It's a, a dark chamber and in the 16th century it was already used to observe uh, sunspots. So we see on the left an image by Demaphysius or a drawing where we can see that when there is a maybe a solar eclipse or a specific burst of the sun then we see something strange on the image which is inverted inside the dark chamber. Okay? This comet obscura was a tool uh, already used in late medieval times to give projections of the outside world but in the 16th century it gradually became a metaphor of how the eye is built up. So by the time of Kepler we generally see people considering the eye itself as a dark chamber in which we have an inverted image of the outside world. In the middle uh, you see a uh, Lodovico Cardi in Il Cipoli, this is uh, an image from the Uffizi, uh, where you can clearly see how parallel the camera obscura is treated and the eye treated. It's also interesting that there's a lens in the eye, but the lens doesn't do anything to the rays. Okay? The lens is basically as if it had no function. Uh, to the right we see Descartes and this is a really funny image uh, I, I can't enlarge it I think but interestingly we still see lines drawn from the specific points uh, at the top to the inside of the eye which hardly break or bend so even in the 18th century we still had some of the medieval tradition lingering on uh, already Alhazen thought that there are so many light rays coming from each one source that it's really the perpendicular rays only that carry the image. We only see the kinds of uh, light rays that are not bent or distorted. When light rays get bent or distorted, we usually see colors. Okay? So this camera obscura model was really widespread at the time when Newton started to do his own experiments with his eye and looking at the sun. Uh, I'm going to skip this. In his first article, he basically lays, lays out a fundamentally material view of light. No one before uh, really thought light to be a body. And Newton, in his first ever scientific paper, at the end, basically suggests that light is nothing else but another type of body. In fact, it's a type of body that's composed of several types of bodies, and the several types of colors that we see will all correspond to different sizes or weights of bodies. Okay? Uh, in the first paper, he says, 
light is declared to be not similar or homogeneous, but consisting of deformed rays, some of which are more refrangible than others. To the left you see a drawing where Newton, looking through a prism, observes that color ba colored bands <coughs> get displaced differently. So if the colors get displaced differently, then they have a physical property that's different. And if they have a physical that property that's different, and this property is stable, then there are different types of light with these different properties. Is it clear, kind of? Colors are therefore affirmed to be not qualifications of light derived from refractions of natural bodies, as it is generally believed, but original and connate properties, which in diverse rays are diverse. The whole of medieval and Renaissance period treated light as something simple and also as something divine to some extent. We don't just have the rainbow uh, in the Bible as a sign of the covenant with God, but we also have a number of authors in medieval times which we can call kind of light mystics, where light and seeing light is connected to understanding, pure light to pure understanding. Uh, and, and Newton goes against this and simply says, well, there are all sorts of bodies maybe jumping up and down, traveling, mixed up in a white, homo apparently homogeneous beam of light. This was uh, a strong pronouncement. Okay, so, so Newton's first article uh, created a huge controversy which lasted for several years and at the end Newton banned some of the publications uh, from being printed. Uh, we can see how the Jesuits never accepted the kind of intrinsic deformity that light is intrinsically heterogeneous. And if we see the images to the left, we always see that they work with angular sizes and they work with the light of different, from different points meeting on the point of the prism before being refracted. Okay? If there's a finite object and we see the image refracted, there are several ways of drawing the image. Okay? The way traditionally in the camera obscura tradition uh, the image was drawn was that we used to uh, draw either how light at a certain point arrived from different points or how from a certain point light gets to different points. Newton, when he really can freely draw his drawings, he's drawing laser beams. Okay, already in the 17th century. On the top right, you see all those dark lines, that's supposed to be the sun's light, parallel beams, where some of the parallel beams get split up and separated by the prism. Okay? Uh, this is, I, I'm going to soon end the first short story. Because after the big debate uh, Newton had, he waited more than 30 years to publish his book on optics. Uh, and the book on optics became one of the biggest uh, hits in 18th century scientific literature. In fact, it became the basis of a whole worldview, uh, the Newtonian worldview, which was an atomistic worldview in many senses. Yet, in the <coughs> imagery, uh, Newton's student, Desiree, if you see the top left image, you see that the rays are parallel, just as Newton wanted to draw them early on in his career. But when Newton, top right, wanted to have at least some parallel rays in a camera obscura setting, in the top right image, to the left, you see that the rays are parallel. Yeah? Then, the French edition uh, the drawers for the French edition said, okay, we, we want to make a more elegant solution, but they were not willing to draw the rays parallel. So if you see uh, to the bottom right, uh, towards us, towards Germany, the last bit of the ray is still not parallel. Okay? So one of the interesting things that I've been kind of trying to work 
get my head around in the last two, three years is that we have one of the most popular scientific theories ever uh, in the history of modern science, but how come that for different audiences the same knowledge was represented in very different ways? Uh, one was conforming to the Camera Obscura tradition, because when you look at the French work, it's not problematic because the image gets inverted. Okay, you remember that the image always gets inverted in the Camera Obscura. But if you look at the left, for the, for the English audience, image inversion was not that important. How is it that something that was a key co concept in the 17th century and something that was important in explaining how we see could get lost in a theory of light, at least for the uh, English edition. It's also an interesting issue because ever since then we are full of bad drawings of prisms. All these are from leading American uh, universities, uh, MIT, one from the NASA, all are different and all are quite fundamentally wrong. So even though a theory was accepted, there wasn't a well enough developed drawing convention which could carry the knowledge of the Camera Obscura as well as the importance of the Newtonian theory uh, or the novelty of the Newtonian theory. Uh, Newton's theory, uh, of course we, we know Newton to be the author of uh, the Principia, the theory of gravitation. So it seems like I'm a bit cheating when I'm saying that the Newtonian paradigm is so much connected to the optics. But in the Principia, there's a new force, a gravitational force, but there's no fundamental ontology, to put it that way. It's the optics that had the ontology, that had a corpus clarion ontology. So even though the Principia became a paradigm scientific text for physicists, the lay scientific worldview was much more based on the optics, which was a corpuscular theory. Okay? Um, is light a body? Throughout the 18th century, there was a disagreement. But with the rise of chemistry, Lavoisier, uh, in his table of elements, listed light as the, force, as the first uh, element. The second was heat, and only the third was oxygen to which he gave the name. So, so it seems that there was a huge split caused by the optics, and at the same time, Newton was maneuvering so well that many people, m many different people could differently interpret his theory. So people saying, I'm a Newtonian, could still mean very different things about it. In a way, rhetoric, uh, took the place of, sort of, persuasion took the place of convincing because, uh, because we see the whole 18th century be more and more people becoming Newtonians but they were still debating with each other on what to consider to be the most important aspects of Newtonianism. Um, here to the left is the only image that I found in the Newton corpus where it's visible that Newton was aware of the problem. This is from an optical lecture manuscript that he never had published in his lifetime. And you can see that the tower gets inverted and the sun doesn't. Okay? Uh, but, it, but the image never got published and in the 18th century we have a whole host of people trying to criticize Newton. To the right we have uh, Castel, a uh, Frenchman from 1740, with a simple explanation to the two drawings. First, Newton, the second, truth. Okay? Uh, showing that there was resentment throughout the 18th century to Newton's uh, optical view. My first ethical conundrum, because it's not a paradox, but it's a kind of query or question. Can we Issue, can we address the issue of ethics when we're talking about drawings? When we're talking about scientific drawings, is there ways of drawing experiments that are unethical? 
Because there's so much talk on, about vagueness or ambiguity in speech that's connected to ethical issues. But how about drawing? When we know that we can't draw what really is there, we are only representing what's out there, but is there an ethical dimension? Okay, so this is the first short story. Um, the second short story uh, is also, it basically starts uh, also in the 17th century. Uh, it's connected to blindness and connected to sight and recovering from blindness. In 1688, uh, Molyneux, strange name for an Irish guy, but he was, uh, he was the author of an important book on optics, addressed a question to John Locke. A problem proposed to the author, at that time he only read a French uh, presence of the essay concerning human understanding. A man being born blind and having a globe and a cube, nigh of the same bigness, committed into his hand, and being taught or told which is called the globe and which the cube, so as easily to distinguish them by his touch or feeling, then, both being taken from him and laid on a table, let us suppose his sight restored to him, whether he could, by his sight and before he touched them, know which is the globe and which the cube, or whether he could know by his sight, before he stretched out his hand, whether he could not reach them, though they were removed twenty or a thousand feet from him. I mean, the same issue, touch and shape and touch and distance. If the learned and ingenious author of the aforementioned treatise think this problem worth his consideration and answer, he may at any time direct it to one that much esteems him and is his humble servant, William Molyneux. Okay? How many of you know about this problem? Yes? Someone? Okay. Hmm. Um, of course, Locke put it in the second edition, so we all read the letter through Locke and his answer to it. But if we read uh, a lot of the sort of 18th century uh, philosophy, then it seems that nearly every serious philosopher had an idea about this. Okay? And because of, uh, uh, partly because of time, uh, I don't want to go that much into uh, the philosophical issue. It's clear that many of the English authors, what we would now call the empirical tradition, uh, generally said, no, even if the guy knows the two things and can tell them apart by touch, simply seeing them won't help. Which is strange because it assumes that there's nothing similar seeing a re rectangle and touching a cube. Okay, so, so one thing is that Maybe I can't connect my two modalities of sight and touch. But it's another thing that, come on, a circle has no corners, a globe has no corners, a rectangle has corners, and a cube has corners. So why wouldn't seeing corners be something that, is, that connects the modalities? Okay? Uh, so as we see, uh, and we go further on in the 18th century, we see that more and more of the empiricist tradition standing to say, well, at least some people could probably tell the two objects apart. Uh, Dr. Saunderson is a recurring example. I think he had the chair that earlier Newton had in Cambridge, and he was a mathematics professor lecturing on geometry, but he was blind. So he had special gadgets, a table with holes on it, so he put uh, facts on it and uh, ropes, so he could tangibly build triangles. Uh, and as he became known, uh, many of the people started to think, oh, come on, if, if Sanderson would have, would have had an operation, surely he could tell uh, which is the cube and which is the globe. On the other hand, in the continent, uh, where most authors who are into innatism uh, they had a 
positive answer, suggesting that there must be some connection between the modalities uh, inborn. We can't just build up the world from totally detached modalities. This is not really what I'm now going to discuss, because I'm more interested in how, with the development of surgical techniques, more and more empirical data was used to uh, discuss the question. Uh, on the right you see a list of some of the most important contributions. Importantly, the first uh, doctor to carry out a modern cataract surgery, William Cheselman, didn't know about the question. But all the other doctors later on in the history knew about the question and quite a few of them wanted to get an empirical answer to this philosophical question. Um, it's, I, I don't want to go through the whole list, so I just have basically one of these uh, uh, people discussed, but because that discussion takes us right to the ethical issue, I do want to say a few things about the other uh, research. Uh, first of all, it's really unclear what's clean experimental data. What does it mean that someone was born blind? The studies showed that people had very different types of blindnesses. Some couldn't tell any difference of light and dark. So you could say that light comes from a certain uh, area. And some could even discern some colors, like if you're in a colored room or you're lit by certain colored uh, lamps. But, but you, so blindness itself became a problem. In the original philosophical question, blindness was not considered to be a problem. Blind is someone who can't see. As soon as the data started to come out, you realize that some blindnesses re, you know, lead to a negative decision, and some will lead to a positive uh, decision on the issue. It also became a problem uh, whether we should really test the globe and the cube. Isn't it enough to show a rectangle or a square and a circle? So people try to manipulate the original question. If you look at the, uh, look at the literature, there's an enormous amount of literature uh, and, and people try all sorts of things to produce clean experimental data and for about 200 years you don't have it. Okay? People are always debating the issue. Uh, today, we would say that, that the whole question is not really great. We, we, the eye needs some kind of light to be able to uh, develop the connections in the brain so as to be able to see. This is clear from facts like really, really congenitally blind people uh, when they learn bright, uh, writing. It's often their visual cortex that does the reading. Okay? So even though they see nothing, their visual cortex is active and it's connected to their touch. Already from the 70s, several experiments were done uh, putting little gadgets on people with lots of spikes, a few hundred little spikes that transmit pressure connected to what a camera sees on the person. And people can learn to see with their foreheads, with their thighs, with all parts of their bodies, if they have learning uh, processes. So these mechanical contrivances can be used to be interpreted as pretty much like visual uh, uh, signs. It's important because tactile stimulus is always connected to sensing ourselves. But sight is not, so it's difficult for someone not having, not having vision to explain what is it to see something that's far away. Okay? But let's get to the, to the second uh, experiment, ever at home, and now I have the messiest slide of them all. But this is from the original article that appeared uh, in the Royal Society of Protection. Is describing one of the boys who got operated on. 
I'm only going to read parts of it, okay? Uh, from the left boat, from about the middle, uh, after the operation, the eye was allowed 10 minutes to recover itself, okay? Uh, in the early period, you had two types of operations. Uh, they cut, they made a little incision, and they tried to push mechanically out the lens, okay? And then you have no lens, but you still have an eye. Or they try to extract the lens. Today it's a very simple operation and they just put in a new artificial lens. Uh, it really doesn't hurt and grandmas are usually very happy after the operation when they see the colors, uh, but they are very sad when they see their wrinkles. Okay, so it's a kind of dual a bliss and a problem. The eye was allowed 10 minutes to recover. A round piece of card of a yellow color, one inch in di diameter, was placed six inches from it. Babies see images only six to ten inches from their eye, and when you remove the eye, the lens, you remove an optical lens of about ten diopters, so that's why the image was placed so close. He said immediately that it was yellow, and a being asked its shape, said, let me touch it, and I will tell you. Being told that he must not touch it, after looking for some time, he said it was round. A square blue car, nearly the same size, size being put before him, he said it was blue and round. So right after the operation, you had colors seen, but not the shapes. Let's move to the second quotation from the right. These experiments were made in the theater of the hospital in which the operation was performed before the surgeons and all the students. He was highly delighted with the pleasure of seeing and said it was so pretty even when no object was before him, only the light upon his eye. The eye was covered and he was put to bed and told, not, told to keep himself quiet but upon the house surgeon going to him half an hour afterwards, his eye was found uncovered, and he was looking at his bed card curtains, which were, which were closed drawn. The bandage was replaced, but so delighted was the boy with seeing, that he again immediately removed it. This circumstance distressed the house surgeon, who had been directed to prevent him from looking at anything till the next day when the experiment was to be repeated. Okay? Finding that he could not enforce his instructions, he thought it most advisable to repeat the experiment about two hours after the operation. So what we see now here is really getting towards a kind of medical issue. We had a philosophical problem first, which was a thought experiment. We had someone able to cure blindness by removing the lens. He didn't know about the philosophical problem. As soon as the surgeons knew about the philosophical problem, they wanted to get the knowledge that they could have possibly had uh, and provided at hand, and they started to enforce specific scenarios of the patient. Imagine that you're being operated and then enrolled to a scenario like this when there are dozens of people looking at you while you know, you want to see something, or you just want to be happy, or you just want to relax. Um, so, the Molyneux problem is one of the earliest examples, I think, when we, had, when we had a direct clash between what's important for the patient, what about the well-being of the patient, and what about knowledge. So this philosophical problem also addresses a fairly deep ethical issue, uh, especially as we get more and more data, it becomes clear that it wasn't always fun to see. A lot of the people who had operations, they had severe problems. Already the very first few cases observed that the blind people didn't always want to see, so people at home never switched on the light, or I mean never lit a candle, uh, they were quite happy being in the dark. And some people even after the, the operation preferred to be in the dark. Some people had severe depression. Some even tried to attempt suicide. Is it ethical to carry out that kind of operation just because I think that seeing is important? 
Um, so in a way, um, it's problematic what are the conditions that justify the operation in the first place. Because people who had really severe blindness, upon operation, never could learn to see. Or if they were too old, they could never learn to see. But of course, you don't know that before you do the operations. So, uh, so for prudent policy making, and this can be, you know, not what to do in specific cases of illnesses, knowledge is required, yet the knowledge that we need is acquired uh, by restricting the patient's well-being and very often by decreasing the life standard of some of these patients. In a way, today we could say that the original question is ill-defined, given what we know about neural development and plasticity today. Yet, a lot of the knowledge that we have was based on the research on this ill-defined question. So, uh, we have a kind of regress problem of knowledge and ethical handling of patients, on the other hand, we don't really know when is, when is it not ethical to do research in medicine. Okay? This book on the right has nothing to do with the monetary problem, but it's one of the recent books that addresses very pointedly this issue. Uh, what are the options of a patient when the doctor is on the one hand trying to cure him, but on the other hand wants to get knowledge? What's the good decision that I, as a person, can make when, for example, they want to test new medicine? Okay. That was the second short story. Okay. I move to a secret favorite of mine, Goethe, and uh, and I deliberately didn't want to bring in modern uh, philosophical text, because I think we have most of these problems already outlined from the 17th to the 19th century as modern science uh, developed. Um, you probably know Goethe as a, as a writer. You know? he, he did scientific research for about 50 years or 60. Uh, his theory of colors was taught at several universities. Uh, his botanical work was referred very positively by people like Darwin. In fact, Darwin considered him as one of the only three forerunners he had. One was his own grandfather, and that was Darwin. Okay, so I go to um, Goethe to look at some of the ways he looks at things. Some of it is connected to colors, but some of it will be connected to plants. Um, and I frame this in a, in a kind of theoretical frame of what really is the task of natural science. Late in his, year, uh, in his life, Goethe had a whole journal he edited him, himself, the Morphologische Hefte. He wanted to popularize his method, so he created a journal and then collected all kinds of texts that he thought is close to his approach. And, uh, and there, explication or a leader or, or making the uh, or kind of response. Goethe writes, natural system is a contradiction in terms. Nature has no system. She has, she is life, and its progress from an unknown center toward an unknowable goal. Scientific research is therefore endless. He also writes in this text that an idea cannot be demonstrated empirically, nor can it be actually proved. An individual who is not in possession will never catch sight of it with his physical eye. Idea with his physical eye. The individual who does possess it easily trains himself to look beyond outer appearances, although returning to reality after this diastole to rearrange himself. It is possible that he might follow this alternating procedure throughout his life. In, uh, late in his life, Goethe says that, well, some of my early science was rather naive. 
Now I know the real gist of modern science. It's polarity and progression. Polarität und Steigerung. So I give two key concepts and I try to utilize these concepts to show how it makes uh, sense in understanding this uh, discovery and in a way also the presentation of this views. So let's get back to color and vision first, okay? To the top uh, you see how a light source is seen through a prism if the prism is close to the screen. You only see a bluish and a yellowish edge. Is that clear? Yeah? That's what that's the kind of edge phenomenon that Goethe started to investigate when he was young. It was a polarity of cool colors and warm colors. Uh, 20, 30 years later, uh, when he wrote his big theory of colors, he returned to these colors, but he was now also considering colors of media. Here you see the sunset and the blue of the sky below, where we have the same kind of warm colors and cool colors, but in the middle you see a single opaque object which exhibits the two colors in a single object. Okay? This, uh, we, all, we can also experience this with smoke. If you see smoke uh, behind a dark background, it gets bluish, and if the smoke is behind a uh, uh, yeah, white background, that it gets reddish. Uh, so Goethe started to work on polar explanations of color phenomena and using different types of polarities to build up a system. Uh, when we see slits through a prism, then we usually see colored bands appear. In a way, uh, much of Goethe's science, when we consider it with respect to Newton, can be understood as a typically romantic approach as opposed to a typically renaissance approach. Uh, in romantic times, polarity was an important concept. Someone discovered infrared light at one end of the spectrum, Herschel. In one year, someone had said, okay, if there's one thing that we don't see at the, at the end of the spectrum, there must be something else that we don't see on the other end of the spectrum. One year after the discovery of infrared light, ultraviolet light was discovered by Winter, who was, again, a German uh, Nathan philosopher, much interested in polar explanations. And as opposed to these polar explanations, we see in Newton a kind of harmony of nature where the color bands of the spectrum are connected to sounds. Here you see sola, fa, sola, mi, if you see on the, on the bottom image, how he had a correlation between the color bands and musical notes. Goethe's experiments were not just, however, dis uh, discussing polarity. If you look at the first image to the right after the prism, that's close to Gianni, you see the typical polarity. If we move further and further away, we have more and more colors strengthening, and at some point we start to get less colors. So what Goethe was doing is to discuss the spatial development of the spectral image, as opposed to Newton, who had very specific distances between the prism and where he took uh, the cross the spectrum of the image. That's really interesting. Goethe discovered something that was only sort of in physiology described more than a hundred years later, that light intensity does not only depend on the wavelength of light, but also depends on the intensity of light. If we see the light as less intense, we see more reds and more greens, and if the light is more intense, we see more blues and yellows. Okay? So this is a dynamic explanation that's based on a polar model. This is the early uh, work on edge colors, or edge colors of edges. Here is an example of media, how media uh, transform colors. We see uh, a solution, one is a 
chromate solution, and another, another is a copper sulfate solution if you're interested. And if you want to try this at home, it's much better than trying to reach your optic nerve with a brass plate. We see that as the medium gets denser, the color changes. But the, in both cases, the color gets a bit more red. Okay? This is the strengthening aspect of the explanation. We have a basic polarity, but as the medium gets thicker, we start to have different colors seen. Okay? Now, uh, to have a logical positivist of myself, okay, this is Otto Neurath from the Vienna Circle. You, you, learn, you learn about the Vienna Circle and logical positivism? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. It's is the kind of tough, strict, analytic tradition, okay? But at the very beginning, uh, in the 1910s, uh, Otto Neurath, who was one of the founders of the tradition, and he later worked a lot with vision. He developed the isotype, which became a kind of symbol language used in museums, but also in airports, uh, to help people with different languages get to know where the toilet is. Uh, and Neurath studied pretty much these examples that I showed to you in Newton and Goethe to say that science is based on the same empirical background can have totally different languages in which we describe the observations and once we have two different languages then we come up with very different theories okay? I give you the quote even the initial statements of successful science are not fixed, since one could begin at the beginning with different unified languages that cannot be translated into each other straight away. And even if the unified languages were more or less fixed, in fact the statements of yesterday and today, appearing at the beginning and at the end of the book, belong to often slightly different languages. Nevertheless, to make good predictions, we could set out from different observation statements that we select from the large number at our disposal that can be steadily increased. What one person neglects as unimportant, and then he shapes his concepts accordingly, may seem essential to another for the predictions. For example, Goethe strongly criticized Newton for omitting certain blurred mar margins of the spectrums as unimportant, where he himself started from this very point. This is how matters stand in every layer of scientific work, not only in the narrower sphere of systems of hypotheses. And this, I think, can be nicely connected to your Levinas quote of, there's not just one object of, of ethics, but there are various perspectives from which we can build up quite coherent systems of understanding. So the issue is not here that someone's wrong, the issue is that even a successful science cannot be translated to another successful science of the same phenomenon. Okay. Uh, in the last few years, this kind of underdetermination problem has received increased attention, for example, in Ger Germany. So they try to create a kind of alternative to Newtonian theory of light a kind of theory of darkness. I told you how parallel rays were important for Newton, but why parallel light rays? Why not parallel darkness rays? So just this year, uh, Olaf Müller, one of the professors in Berlin, wrote a whole book, Mehr Licht, on trying to show how differently a Newtonian theory would be if you had parallel rays of not light but darkness as informing your whole view of the cosmos. Uh, and so they had some quite, they had large uh, uh, grant money. So just the lamp that's at the big below, sort of uh, litting up this whole experimental setup, was about 40,000 euros. Um, uh, which basically meant that even today you can reproduce the experiments to conform uh, your theory to the different. Okay. But I want to finish on, uh, on something that is connected to vision, but not the vision of light as an outside source, but a vision of how understanding 
is, in, is seen as inside. And that's what if it is I I mean Italy in that chair. I was already invited last year by Jamie. And I had pretty much the same impression that Goethe had uh, more than 200 years ago when in his travels to Italy he went down from Padua all the way to Palermo and he wanted to understand the archetypal plant. What's the plantness of a plant in, on this journey? And when I first came here I saw lots of plants that I've never seen in these sizes like pickles and you know, you, you, you have lots of plants that we also have maybe in rooms or maybe sometimes outside, but you never see their full development as you can see here. So I want to end with some remarks on plants. Um, when he started his journey, uh, okay, Goethe by that time was a successful author of Werther, The Sorrows of the Young Werther. He was a minister and he escaped from his duties, I think right after one of his birthday celebrations. He had a birthday, he decided not to go back, and he left to Italy for nearly two years. He wrote a letter saying, please send my salary, okay? And which he did receive. And so he was just uh, studying clouds, painters, plants, various uh, phenomenal domains. In Padua, he said, here where I'm confounded with a great variety of plants, my hypothesis that it might be possible to derive all plant forms from one original plant becomes clear to me and more exciting. Only when we have accepted this idea will it be possible to determine genera and species exactly. His early research is very much connected to classification. Is it not possible to classify plants? How about is the Linnaean enterprise in botany a uh, feasible enterprise? So far, this has, I believe, been done in a very arbitrary way. At this stage of my bot botanical philosophy, I have reached an impasse, and I do not see how to get out of it. The whole subject seems to me to be profound and of far-reaching consequences. Travelling towards Palermo, we rise to Herger. The primary plant is going to be the strangest creature in the world, for which nature herself shall envy me. With this model and the key to it, it will be possible to go on forever inventing plants and know that their existence is logical. That is to say, if they do not actually exist, they could, for they are not the shadow phantoms of vain imaginations, but possess an inner necessity of truth. Uh, Importantly, the, the archetypal plant, or the primal plant, never appears in his writings on plants. But it's more a heuristic, a kind of research procedure that helps him do his plant morphology. And then in the end, when he gets old, he simply says, well, I quite naively conceive of plant metamorphosis. But to give you an idea of what he means, What's the connection between two, these two leaves? Are they from the same species? No. It's not even clear whether it's the same species or even the same genus, but they are actually from the same plant. Okay? So if you look at this series, and that's how Goethe's work has been carried on, even today there are people working in this tradition, they took just leaves of the individual plant and put it in a sequence. Is it easy if I take one leaf out and give it to someone who hasn't seen that leaf in a sequence. Is it easy to find its place in the sequence? It's fairly easy to find the place in the sequence, okay? Is it easy to linguistically describe what we see? It's really not that easy. We, we can say that it's sort of more fleshy and then it gets sort of more spiky, okay? It, it's easy to use language. It, which gives us some idea, but it's really hard to grasp 
the sequence, the temporal development of the series uh, in language. Okay? So, uh, so what Goethe finally said is that not, it's not an archetypal plant or a primal plant, but it's the leaf that can be transformed into anything on a plant. And understanding the particular way that this archetypal leaf is transformed means that I understand the plant because I can get a phenomenal feeling for the plant. It also means that lots of the differences of the individuals can be understood within a single species. If the plant has more light, then it's going to have less fleshy leaves. If it's in shadow, it's more fleshy, okay? So there's a lot of the phenomenal domain that I can sense, I can experience, I can train myself to work with, but it's very hard to express it in language, okay? I want to have a sense of a theory in a linguistic form, but nature as a living system is always going to counteract some of that tension. Okay? So now let's get back to the discussion he had with this young colleague, S. Meyer. S. Meyer first wrote a review of a different textbook where he said there are basically two ways of studying plants. One can study the living metamorphosis as a something, I don't know what, capable of existing in regulated alteration. It's always altering, but there's some regulation to the alteration. Or, one may also wish to grasp it as something constant, and therefore dead, in one or several widely separated situations. Okay, this is a specific species of a plant. It belongs to this specific small category. And the next species is the next category. Okay? Whoever declares himself with Linne for the latter method takes the safer course. However, once we have ventured into the cycle of metamorphosis, we may no longer hesitate or even turn back. These were the lines that triggered Goethe to invite this young researcher, um, because as he explained, the concept of metamorphosis is a highly estimable gift from above. <coughs> but at the same time a very dangerous one. It leads to formlessness, destroys knowledge, disintegrates it. It is like a centrifugal force and would lose itself in the infinite if a counterweight were not, were not provided. I'm referring to the specification force, that tenacious capacity for persistence inherent in whatever has attained existence, a centrifugal force. But in science, on the one hand, we have a force to specify things. But the way the world is, it's always going to disintegrate it. And then the way we want to understand the world, we are always disintegrating our own knowledge. Mayer, in his response, says, well, already the effort to dissolve the contradiction inherent in the natural system is a natural drive that cannot fully be satisfied. So it was like, these people in the early Romantic period could speak the same language of polarities, of specification, but also of formlessness. Goethe, after this response, was so satisfied that he decided not to give his plant collection to Meyer, partly because it showed that even discussing this issue leads to the same regress problem that we discovered uh, on the object level. And because Goethe's view is the first evolutionary view of knowledge, which at the same time was not just a theoretical idea about scientific knowledge, but also created successful scientific explanations or theories. Here is the third ethical conundrum that I have. What are the obligations of an evolutionary knowledge of faculties if we know that our knowledge is going to get disintegrated, if we know that we can train our perceptual abilities to some extent, if we know that in believing in developmental uh, stance, we do change ourselves. Okay? Just to give a recent example, people who believe that they have, that, I, that 
intelligence, IQ, is inherited, their, their IQ cannot be as quickly increased as people who believe that intelligence can be increased uh, by interaction and practice. So if we believe that we can transform ourselves, it seems that in certain cases we are better at transforming ourselves. But how about specification, the need in modern systematic uh, societies where we use knowledge to classify patients, illnesses, da, 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 when we at the same time have the knowledge that these kinds of systems are going to get transformed in the process. Okay? So that's my third ethical question. Thank you very much. Can you remember this last <laughs> year? So wonderful rain.